Well, welcome to our webinar. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Illinois Humanities Council and then introduce you to our guest, Kim. Um, today's program is, is presented by the Illinois Humanities Council Speakers Bureau. The mission of Illinois Humanities is to strengthen the social, political, and economic fabric of Illinois through constructive conversation and civic engagement. Rose, the Rose Scholar Speaker Bureau supports that mission by inviting Illinois authors, artists, and scholars to share their expertise and enthusiasm with people in the community throughout the state. After the event, you will receive an email from us that has a survey, and we hope that you'll take a moment to complete it. Now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker today. Uh, Kim Sagathas is an award-winning Ojibwa author from Freeport, Illinois. Her family is from White Earth Reservation, which is in the northwest corner of Minnesota. Kim writes Native American fiction and nonfiction, as well as YA and children's books. She has a degree in theater and vocal music. She drums and sings and crafts dream catchers. Um, she's given, given many presentations in her native regalia and enjoys sharing her culture with others. But today, Kim is joining us from Freeport. So welcome, Kim. Thank you very much for that. Well, Buzu, which is hello in Ojibwa, and I am Ojibwa, um, which is the same as Chippewa. Most people have heard of Chippewa. And um, my native name is Becca Dezikwa, and it means quiet woman. Um, I was named when I was younger. Um, and I, at the end of the presentation, you'll probably wonder why I have the name quiet woman, but as such as it is. My family is from White Earth Reservation, which is um, about an hour east of Fargo in Minnesota. And so I'm a Minnesota girl. I'm transplanted down here to Illinois. Um, and so I was born and raised in Minnesota, land of 10,000 plus lakes. And so I'm used to a lot of water. So when I got down here, I was uh, looking for some water. We do have the Pecatonica that runs through um, Freeport, but it's a small version of it, that's for sure. Um, okay, so my, I, just a little about my family. Um, my grandfather grew up on the reservation and um, my father passed away when I was one. My parents married when they were really young and my mother moved us after that into the inner city of Minneapolis. And um, Something to know about my mom is she was not, she is not and was not because she has unfortunately passed on now. Um, she is not native. And so she's Irish Catholic. And so I was raised um, in an, an Irish Catholic family. And I didn't have a lot to do with the native side of my family at all um, until when I was became an adult and started having children of my own. Um, I really wanted to pass on that um, side of my heritage. I had a real strong um, understanding of the Irish culture and the German culture. My grandmother was German. And so um, I wanted to make sure that I could pass on it all, all of my heritage to my children. And so I, um, we had lost touch with my father's family by then. So my um, mother um, helped me um, by telling me where to start looking for them. And so I actually called a number and um, they sent me, the Lafayette, Louisiana uh, Bureau sent me a phone book, <laughs> it was a phone books. And um, I was able to write letters <laughs> to everybody in the phone book. Um, keep in mind, this was the 1980s. And um, I was able to uh, find my uncle, my uncle Jimmy. And um, I was very excited at that time to be able to uh, find my family. I flew down to Lafayette, Louisiana from Minnesota and um, basically began my education um, as they unfolded me into that side of the family. They had been looking for me for years. We had moved quite a bit, so they weren't able to find us. So I was very, very excited to start learning about that side of myself. And so I was taught um, all kinds of things. I was taught how to native garden, <coughs> excuse me, I was taught um, some native language and some music. And I, um, like was mentioned before, I drum and sing. Um, and so I really immersed myself in the culture. Um, I, we did some cooking and um, just, I realized culturally how uh, similar I was anyway in the belief system um, that my family had. And they're very, um, 
conservation um, conscious. And so the way they garden and the way that they take care of the land um, is uh, important to them. And they passed that on to me, but I already had a little bit of that. Anyway, my mother had gigantic gardens. And so I grew up gardening anyway. So it was just um, a different take, a little bit different take um, on, on that sort of thing. Um, but now I have four children and I have six grandchildren and I have passed all of that knowledge on to them. And I am in the process of opening up a Native American inspired gift store um, in Freeport. Um, and so I'm really excited about that and that'll be open in April. And um, I'm gonna have classes out of there and, and things like that. And so I'm really, really excited about that. Um, but I, I'm really immersed. I've really chosen to immerse myself in, in that culture. And my children are, are um, interested in that as well. And so they bring some of that into their lives as well and then with their children. Well, like I said, I, was, I am Ojibwa and there were Ojibwa that lived in Illinois. Um, they, the Voyagers used to come down, the, big, the traders, they would come down in their big boats and um, they would stop at the villages and they would see uh, the women and they would take them as a wife and then they would put them back in the boat and they would come down into this, um, into this area and they would settle. There wasn't a whole bunch of us here, a whole bunch of Ojibwa here. Um, there was a smattering, but we were here and there were a lot of other tribes, of course, that were also here. Uh, I, uh, when I first moved here, I thought I had heard so much about the fox and the sock. I didn't realize that there were so many other tribes that used to be here. There were quite a bit. Um, the, obviously the Illini were here because we, Illinois is named for the Illini tribe. Um, the Iroquois were here, uh, the Ottawa and the Potawatomi. Now the Ottawa and the Potawatomi and the Ojibwa were actually one tribe at one time and they split many hundreds of years ago and um, they became three separate ent entities. The Kickapoo were here, the Kaskaskia were here, the Miami, the Shawnee, and of course the Sock and the Fox. Uh, those are just some of the tribes, the major tribes that were here. The Dakota Sioux was also here. Um, and so <clears throat> up in the Northern part of Illinois. Well, what federally recognized tribes do we still have in, in uh, Illinois? Well, unfortunately we don't have any federally recognized tribes here. Um, on March 28th, 1830, Congress passed the Indian Removal Act, uh, which was the beginning of the forced relocation um, of the Native Americans. Uh, and so from this area on east, <coughs> excuse me, um, we have something called the Northern Trail of Tears that runs through the bottom of the state of Illinois. It's the, the tail, Trail of Tears is also known as the trail where they cried. I don't know if anyone's ever heard it called that before, but tribes moved west across the bottom of um, our state and the Kaskaskia and the Peoria were the last tribes to move, move out in Illinois. And that was about uh, 1832. So the natives that lived in Illinois did not just travel to the bottom of the state and then head west. They all, they crossed from wherever they were. They headed west from wherever they were into Indian territory, what was called Indian territory, which was around Oklahoma. Um, between the 1830 Indian Removal Act um, and between that and 1850, the US government used forced treaties and US Army action to move 100,000 Native American Indians living east of the Mississippi River to Indian country located west of the river. And the Trail of Tears runs through, runs through Southern Illinois and it stretches nearly 60 miles long. The trek across Southern Illinois is along the Golconda Cape Girardeau Trace, which is from the Ohio River at Golconda to the Mississippi River west, um, west of present day Ware, Illinois, W-A-R-E. There's a place called Ware, Illinois. Um, the Trail of Tears does have a, a state forest and it's situated in Western Union County, which is five miles northwest of Jonesboro and 20 miles south of Murfreesboro. And it's over 5,000 um, acres that are within the state forest. So the original route segments now exist as State Highway 146, 
and the lesser traveled country roads and then abandoned road cuts through the forested areas. Well, during the harsh winter of 1838 to 1839, 11 Cherokee uh, detachments, which consisted of over 15,000 Cherokee Indians, passed through, this, through Southern Illinois. And many perished from cold and hunger um, along this long, painful journey um, from their home in the Smoky Mountains to the new government designated uh, lands in Eastern uh, Oklahoma. It took three months for the Cherokee to completely get across the state of Illinois due to the freezing temperatures that caused giant ice blocks to form. And then they crashed into each other in the Mississippi River. So the, the, this is the portion of the trail of, of tears where they suffered the most deaths due to not being prepared for the cold. They couldn't cross the river. And so they had to camp alongside, alongside of it before so that they, they had to wait. Um, one of my elders tells their story and I wrote it down because I thought it was really significant and important. So I'm gonna read that to you. The winter of 1838 was bitter cold mixed with rain and snow in Southern Illinois. The days and weeks spent in crossing Southern Illinois were the most brutal for the Cherokee nation. Many landowners would not allow the Cherokee to camp on their land or to cut firewood for warmth on hot food. Only adding to the Cherokee's misery, the Mississippi was frozen solid far out from the riverbank and in the center were blocks of ice as big as houses. As the river flowed, the huge ice blocks crashed down with mighty shocks. The fearful noise went on day and night for a month as the Cherokee watched the mighty Mississippi in awe and wonder as they waited to cross into Missouri. So it was a really, really horrible time for those natives and many died waiting to cross the river. And like I said, um, within that group of Cherokee, that's where most of the deaths um, happened. Well, once the tribes left um, and the Indian removal was finished, nobody, basically nobody moved back into the state of Illinois. If they did, it was an accountable amount of Native Americans. Um, no, you know, as, as the years went on, you know, you couldn't, uh, as a native, you couldn't get a place to live here. You couldn't rent here. Um, you couldn't uh, get a job. No one would hire you. And there wasn't anything for them. There was no reason for them to be here. And so a lot of them just stayed out. And it wasn't until, <clears throat> really until 1953, that the AIC opened in Chicago. The AIC is the American Indian Center. And they invited natives back into the area and they helped them find work and they helped them uh, find a place to live. They do strive to be the primary uh, cultural and community resource. For over 65,000 Native Americans now that live in the greater uh, Chicago and metro metropolitan area, Chicago is actually now the home to the third largest uh, Native American uh, population. It's the third largest urban <laughs> Native American population um, with over 140 tribes that are uh, tribal nations that are represented. And so it's grown um, from when it opened to now. And so there are six, over 65,000 Native Americans that live in the state of Illinois. And I think that's pretty wonderful. Well, you know, they offer powwow. So it used to be they opened the center for people that were native, but they they opened it up later for people that are interested in the native culture. So if you are interested in going to a powwow, which is kind of a big party, um, they have a lot of dancing, a lot of food, a lot of crafts. And so if you want to immerse yourself in the native culture for a couple hours, those, that's a good place to go. They invite people out uh, to dance. And uh, you're able to go, uh, they always dance in the circle and you're able to go out with them. And so that's always fun and exciting to be able to do. Uh, the crafts and the beadwork are wonderful. And if you're looking for a drum or a flute, that's the place to go. Um, so it's, they're, they're a lot of fun. Lots of good food, um, lots of uh, fry bread and things like that. Um, they also, the AIC off, offers classes, education for people interested in the culture. Um, they have art, um, artists that come through and they display their art and they have uh, art galleries and things like that. So it's just for everyone now who's interested in the culture. Well, long, long before 
for the Indian removal. Like I said, there were lots of tribes that lived here. And so if you think back to our area, way back in the 1700s, for example, you know, how did they live here? You know, how, how did they, um, how did they survive? What, what did they do? And so that's what we're, a little bit about what I'm going to talk about next. Um, they were considered woodland Indians. And the Midwest is comprised of the woodland Indians. And basically that means that they lived on the land. Um, now, how you live here in Illinois or Minnesota or Iowa or Wisconsin is not necessarily how you would live in Arizona. For example, they would probably not do a lot of fishing in Arizona, whereas they did a lot of fishing here. So um, there was water aplenty. And of course, in um, Illinois, we have rivers as well as uh, Lake Michigan. And so in the summertime, they would have lived near a water source because water source life so very very important they did um, move twice a year so they had two major camps one was in the spring and then one they moved to which was their winter camp would they would have moved in the late fall and they would have moved away from the water a little bit I always uh, talk about the example of it would be great to camp out on Navy Pier in the summer not so great to camp out on Navy Pier in February it's a little cold and you probably get blown into the water. So they did move a little farther in more due to that reason. There was uh, pretty much a division of work between men and women. Children were taught really young how to do chores and they helped as soon as they could. Um, the men were in charge of the security of the camp. Um, they uh, didn't allow their women to wander off or their young children. Um, it was a lot. Um, there was a lot of other tribes in the area, and if they were going by, they could steal your women if they were out berry picking, so you wanted to keep them close to camp. Um, same with your children. They were, uh, men were also responsible for the hunting um, and providing uh, food, uh, part of the food anyway, as far as for hunting, um, and so they went out in large hunting parties, and, and uh, young men went out when they were ready and able um, and they showed that they were ready to go out with the hunting parties. And so the men went out and hunted and there were bison in the state of Illinois until 18, about 1810. Um, and so they could have had a bison kill, they could have had a, a bear kill. Um, any of the larger animals, they, put, uh, they would take the animal down, they would kill the animal and then put a peace pipe in the animal's mouth and light it and say a prayer for that animal for giving his life so that that tribe could be sustained. Of course, the bigger kills were, were ideal because they used every part of an animal that they could. They never wasted anything. And so obviously they needed the meat, but also the furs um, for bears. They used bear, bear grease. They used it in their cooking and they used it on their hair. I know kind of strange, <coughs> but kind of put put it in their hair. I don't know what that would have smelled like after a couple of days or a couple of weeks even, but um, they, like I said, they used every part of, um, of an animal. In, um, I do author uh, books and, and a little bit about that was, uh, information was given to you earlier about that, but I do have a book called The Life and Times of the Ojibwa People. And um, in that book, it talks about recipes that um, they used to make. And I know my grandmother used to make cattail soup and I know there's a lot of things you can do with cattails. And um, one of the recipes in that book is jellied moose nose, where they cut the nose off the moose and they boil it. And then they pull the hair off of it. And then the meat from the moose nose is actually in the nostril. So like I said, they ate everything they could. And uh, it's probably not a recipe you wanna have for your Thanksgiving, but I thought that was pretty good. So the men did also did, um, some help with the children, but it was mostly uh, the, the women's jobs to do that. Um, they did bead work as well. Some men did some wonderful bead work. Women, of course, were responsible for childbirth and child uh, raising and um, settling the home. When they moved from one camp to the other, the woman would take down the teepee and put it on her back and she would walk it to the next camp and then she would set it up. Here they lived in teepees or longhouses, which is pretty much, a longhouse is pretty much exactly what I'm, what the word says. It's kind of like a longhouse. And so 
there was usually more than one generation that lived in there. So you could have mom and dad and grandma and grandpa in there. You could have lots of kids in there, maybe aunts and uncles. Um, so you had a lot of people, especially in, in, in your teepee too. So it wasn't just you, it wasn't mom and dad and just the kids all the time. It was generational sometimes. Um, they, the teepees have a hole at the top. Most people know that. Um, they have a fire in them in the, in the uh, winter time, not in the summer, but in the winter. Um, I can tell you that those fires, it still makes it very smoky in there. Um, even though the smoke is going up to the top, it's still a little smoky in there. So it's something to get used to. Uh, the women had the fires going um, in the inside in the winter and the outside. And in the summer, it was the outside. She was uh, in charge of food. So when the men brought home that kilt, they kind of dropped it at the women's feet and said, here you go, honey, it's time for you to, to get to work. And so she took a knife out of her bag and she uh, started cutting up the meat and processing the meat. So they hung it, they dried it, um, they cooked it. And so there was just several ways that they, um, they worked with their, um, their meat. They also uh, brain tanned the hides and that's exactly what it sounds like. You take the brains from the animal and you use that in the, in the uh, tanning process of the hide and it makes it very soft and supple. And so they were responsible for making the clothing and things like that and for doing the sewing. Their thread was sinew, which is uh, part of a ligament of a deer's leg. And so that's what they used for thread. And they made their moccasins out of that um, as well. Ojibwa, uh, some people believe the word Ojibwa actually means puckered. And it's just a sewing stitch in the way they uh, make their moccasins. They're, they're kind of a puckered look on their moccasins. And uh, they're not a real smooth look. Um, and so little girls were taught very young how to, how to sew and, and help mom. Um, cooking was uh, something a little different than how we do it. They didn't have three meals a day. They had something cooking on the um, on the fire all the time. So if you were hungry, you just went to the fire or you said, mom, I'm hungry. And she would give you some food. And then periodically through the day, she would just check that. Um, if it was a pot, she would just check that pot and make sure um, that there was something in it. They didn't have pots and things like that until the voyagers came down and did some trading with them. That's when they got their pots um, and their, their different blankets and things like that. And uh, they traded, uh, pelts and usually beaver pelts were, were the most uh, coveted pelts because of course the beaver hats and the beaver coats were going on during that time. So um, the beaver was almost uh, hunted out of extinction. It was not a good thing, but um, they, they also were able to trade other, other furs as well uh, to get colored beads. They loved colored beads, um, pony beads. There's just lots of things that they were able to get there. And so um, the trading in this area was, was a big deal. Um, children back then uh, played lots and lots of fun games. Um, when they didn't have to work, um, they were also uh, in the wintertime told a lot of stories. Wintertime was a kind of a winter solstice time was uh, really a time for storytelling. And it was when the elders could sit down around the big fires and they would tell stories and that's when they would pass things along um, to their children and their children's children. And there were stories that uh, women couldn't know, um, that men couldn't uh, tell their women. There were stories that weren't meant for children. And so it, the elders were the ones that were responsible for passing that along and for deciding who could hear uh, whatever story that happened to be. Um, a lot of times after storytelling, um, the uh, children would be all put to bed. If you can imagine a camp of, and in the summertime, they had like a hundred teepees um, in one village. And so that was a lot of kids to be putting down, down at the same time. And sometimes they didn't, they didn't go to sleep. Um, one of the things that uh, my uncle told me, uh, it was that, he had, he had heard one of the old things they would say was, if you didn't go to sleep, uh, the great horned owl would swoop down and grab you and carry you off and I would never see you again. And so <laughs> I think that would be a little scary for, for a child, but that I suppose that would make them be a little quieter. Um, but parents would tell their stories 
their kids' stories as well that were appropriate for them. And one of the stories that children knew uh, at a very young age was the story of creation. And every tribal nation has their own story. And interestingly enough, they're very similar even though I don't think they all sat down and had a conversation about it beforehand. But I thought I would tell you the story, the Ojibwa story of creation that, what, that was told to everyone. And that was a story that was being able to pass down to everyone. So, and it was also, this story will also explain to you why the turtle is such a huge um, deal in our culture. It's a, it's a spiritual animal that means a lot to us. You find it on our clothing, you'll find it on our, uh, moccasins and drums and everything. And so it's a very important uh, animal. It's very spiritual for us, as well as the muskrat. So the story of creation is that Gitche Manitou, who um, is the great spirit, looked down on the earth and he was not happy. He could see all the lying and cheating and hurting. Everybody was hurting each other. It was just not a good world. And he was so despondent and he thought, well, I'm going to wash it away and I'm going to start over. And so he sent a great flood and flooded the entire earth. Well, there was one man, <coughs> excuse me, one man left and his name was Winnebazoo. And he was left floating on a log in the middle of the water. There was no land anywhere. And Winnebazoo was sitting there wondering what he was gonna do. He had been on that log for a very long time. Weeks had gone by and he didn't know if he would ever see land again. He knew Gitche Manitou was very, very upset. He didn't know what was going to happen. The only company that he had were the birds that were flying ahead all around him and then all the animals that were swimming around the log. He got to thinking about that and he decided that he might possibly be able to talk Gitche Manitou into making some sort of land that he could float over to and get off on if he could get the earth from the bottom under the water. And so he talked to his animals that were around him, all the animals, all his animal friends. And he said, could one of you or a couple of you go down and get some dirt and bring it up? And then I'll see what I can do with that. And so one by one, the animals went down and they dove down deep into the water. And he was anxiously sitting on the log and he was waiting to see what happened. Well, some of the animals never came back, but a lot of the animals came floating back up. And he realized right away that these animals had perished because the water was so deep that they weren't able to get all the way to the bottom. And he thought, well, I can't dive down there. There's no way. If these animals aren't getting down there, I'm not going to be able to dive down there either. And his, so a lot of his friends were gone. <coughs> Excuse me. A lot of his friends were, you know, were winded and, and almost gone. And, and he felt so bad that he had sent these animals down to try to do this. And it, it wasn't successful. And he lost friends. And he didn't, and that was the only idea he had. And he didn't know what he was going to do now. So he laid back on the log and closed his eyes and thought, well, this is it. I guess I'm going to be floating here forever. So after a while, very, very despondent, he sat there sighing, <coughs> excuse me, and word had gotten around and Muskrat heard about what was going on. So Muskrat swam over and he said, Nanabazoo. I can do this. Why don't you send me down there? I'm a great swimmer and I'm used to diving deep down in the water. I can hold my breath for a long time. I can do this. I'll just go get the, the earth. I'll bring it back up here. Everything will be fine. Well, Nanabazoo wasn't having any of that. And he's like, no, no, no. I, there's no way. I can't let you go down there. I've lost a lot of friends trying and you're just this little muskrat. These, these other fish and these other animals were a lot bigger than you and they just couldn't do it. And so he's like, there's no way I'm letting you down there. And well, Muskrat wasn't having any of that. He wanted to go down there. He was bound and determined. He knew he could get the dirt. There was no way you're going to talk him out of it. And finally, Winnebazoo gave in and said, okay, go ahead, go get, go down there. 
If you start to have problems, please come up right away. I don't want to lose any more friends, but go ahead and try. Okay. And I'm going to be watching for you. And so Muskrat was really excited and he dove down into the water, disappeared. Several minutes passed and he, there was no sight of him. And all the animals began to kind of look down in the water and look for him. Well, it was but a few more minutes that the lifeless body of a muskrat floated back up. He had perished trying to do this task as well. And Winnebazoo was beside himself. He was so upset because he knew he shouldn't have let him down there. Man, he was really, really upset. So he picked him up carefully out of the water and he laid him on the log. And when he did that, body of the muskrat rolled over. And in his paw was some dirt. And what had happened was the muskrat had gotten all the way to the bottom of the water somehow and tried to get back up with the dirt and he wasn't able to do it before he ran out of air. And so Winnebazoo took that dirt from muskrat's paw and stood up on the log and held it up for Gitche Manitou to see and prayed to Gitche Manitou that, that muskrat's um, offer of dirt and what he had gone through would not be in vain. And she managed to look down at all the animals that had perished and muskrat as well. And he looked down at the dirt and he told Winnebazoo to stand and blow in all four directions. And so Winnebazoo went in all four directions and up from the water came land and land surrounded him all around. And Winnebazoo was able to paddle over to the shoreline and get off, get off of the log. And he was so ecstatic to be off of the log. And so he and Gitche Manitou made the trees and the flowers and the bushes and gave places for the birds to land and, and he just, started the whole earth over again and it was beautiful and, and gorgeous but you know when he was finished when Ibizu looked around and he thought hmm I miss muskrat and he walked over to muskrat and he picked him up and he gathered all of his friends all of his animal friends together and he said we must not forget muskrat he has taught us a great lesson it doesn't matter how big you are, how tall, how skinny, what you look like. It doesn't matter on the outside what you look like because we are all destined to do great things. And we all have the capability of doing wondrous things. And you have to look beyond what a person looks like in order to see, see into their soul and see that. And the animals nodded and they realized they realized how much of a sacrifice that muskrat had given them. Well, Winnebazoo laid muskrat back down on the log. And as he stood up, he saw a tortoise in the water and he got to thinking, you know, I don't ever want to do this again. I think I'm going to fix it so that I don't ever have to worry about this. And so he gathered the world up into a ball and he set it on the musk or on the, excuse me, on the tortoise's back. It didn't phase the tortoise at all. And that turtle just kept floating on down, down in the water, just minding his own business. When a bazoo said out loud, now, if this happens again and we have a flood, we're gonna be fine because the world now is being held up on a turtle's back. And so if it floods again, we're just gonna float along. And so because of that, the tortoise, again, and the turtle are very, very important in our culture because we believe that the world is being held up on the turtle's back. So that's just one of the stories that would have been told uh, to the tribe, to the children and, and others. Uh, that was the, the story of creation um, is very important in any culture. Um, in the Christian culture as well, there's um, some a little bit of a, a difference in the story. However, um, there's a lot of things that are the same as well. So children who uh, had their story time 
and we're told to go to bed and the whole owl swooping down to get you didn't work. Um, sometimes they would, the parents would sing to them and maybe that would calm them down. When the children were younger and when they were babies, they were sang to quite a bit. And we do that in our culture too, I, I think. Um, I know I sing to my grandchildren. Um, I sing and drum when they're really, really little. And then as they get older, they're more interested in the drum than they are in anything that's coming out of my mouth. And so I thought today I would introduce you to my drum. I have several of them actually, but this is one of them. So on. this is what it looks like. I don't know if you can see it too well with the light. Um, it's a bigger one. I have um, one that's kind of a middle size and then one that's a smaller one as well. And so this is the back of the drum. And it's strung with sinew. That's what this stuff is. Um, this is actual sinew. So what happens with real sinew is that it will crack because it'll dry out. And then I have to have the drum restrung. I don't make these. I have friends that make them. So I have to, I have, to have them uh, restring the drum. Um, they know I love different stones. And so they put a stone in here for me. And then how you hold the drum is you hang on to it like this where the bigger part is on the bottom. You never hold the strings because of course you don't want them to break. This is called a tom, a tom-tom. Most people have heard of a tom-tom. It's also called a beater, but I call it a tom. And so what I thought I would do for you today is I would sing an Ojibwa lullaby song. Um, this is the song that um, I sing to my own grandchildren. I've sang to my children before. And um, it's just one of the songs that uh, it, it's kind of a family song. Um, my kids all know it as well as my grandkids know, um, almost all of them. I have one that's just a year. So <laughs> we're, we're working on just getting him to say uh, anything other than mom and dad at this point. So, all right. So I'm going to sing and drum for you. And just so hopefully you can, it'll come across and you can hear me here. Just a light a little bit. Okay. Sleep, sleep, little one, sleep, sleep, little one, sleep, sleep, little one, now go to sleep, now go to sleep. When I do these presentations um, in the fall, um, I uh, teach and sing Ni uh, Mi which which is a, a I, am a thank, I Am Thankful song. And um, we usually get together and sing that song at Thanksgiving and our family. So if you're new to the family or you're, not, you're invited to Thanksgiving at our house, um, it's kind of an interesting time because we do pray. Um, we do sing and um, we have a little bit different um, items on our Thanksgiving menu. Uh, we do have a, we do have turkey and we have ham and it's traditional, but we also have wasabi, which is a glaze for our, that we make for our meat. Um, we do have a wild, lot of wild rice stuff um, as well. And so we we have a little bit different <laughs> different uh, holiday meals than than uh, some people do anyway. Um, okay, so just a little bit about, um, now obviously I talked a little bit about the fact that they did hunt and uh, that's how they fed people. They also uh, went fishing, of course, and uh, they also did a lot of gardening. Um, they had huge gardens, actually. We don't, they didn't have a Walmart or a Cub Foods or a Hy-Vee, so they had to have their food grown. And so everyone in the camp actually worked on the, um, on the garden, even the children. And so it was a, it, the children, the elders, everyone was out there. And in the spring, of course, they planted. And then in the fall, they harvested. And in the fall, when they harvested, they actually dug really deep holes in the ground and they did bury some of their food and containers. 
um, for the Ojibwa, they were buried in birch bark containers and they were several feet deep down in the ground. Um, there were bears in the area. And so bears can smell food miles away and they, but they're lazy animals. And so they will dig for a while, but they won't dig for hours for their food. They'll just lumber off somewhere. And so you want to dig down deep enough to uh, make sure your food's still there. So if you bury your food before you leave your summer camp and then you come back in the spring um, and you bury it in the same spot, you know where to dig it up. And so um, right away when you get into camp in the summer or in this early spring, um, before you have a chance to put in a garden, you'll need to eat something. And so you can dig that food up, that dried food that you have down in there. Um, and that will help sustain you as while your camp is, is getting going. Um, and so they did things, um, they did plantings called the three sisters planting, which is corn, be beans, and squash. And uh, they were planted a little bit differently than we would. They were planted in mounds and they planted the corn first. And the, after the corn was a couple of feet high, they would plant the beans because the beans love to climb. They would climb up the stock. And then um, they had planted the squash and they planted those three plants together because they complement each other. And it's also called companion planting. And they each put something into the soil that helps the others. And so um, the squash crawls around the, um, along the bottom and hopefully squashes out. Yes, I, I didn't mean to say that pun. Um, all the weeds that are on the bottom down there. And I have a picture that I took the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwa in Minnesota have a three sister uh, garden. And uh, they put a fence around it because people were wandering through it actually trying to pick things out of there. So they actually put a fence around it. Um, but it's uh, located in near Mille Lacs Lake, Minnesota. They have a trading post up there. And that's actually where natives come and bring their items and they can trade for other items that other people have brought in. So it's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting uh, place to go. And you can actually go and buy things there as well if you don't have anything to trade. So I am going to hopefully share my screen here and show you a picture of the three sisters planting. Okay, so hopefully you can see this. Um, like I said, there's a fence around it. You can see the corn, the squashes along the bottom. It, at the time I took the picture, of course it was flowering. You can see that. And then you can tell just by the different types of leaves that are growing up that um, there's the beans and they're, they're crawling up the stalk. And this was quite a large garden. Um, and so if you were to look across the fields now, and see this, it would be mound after mound after mound after mound. So they're all raised mounds. They're not like flat into the ground. And that was of course for water runoff, but, um, and for the roots to take really, really, really good, uh, get in there really good and, and connected to the earth. Okay, so, Beans, corn, and squash. Um, they also planted all kinds of other things as well. Um, corn is not original to this country. It's, uh, it's from Mexico. Um, and so it came from there um, and was brought up into the rest of the United States where now it's planted. Um, of course, people know it as maize. And um, that is another word for, uh, for corn. And there are lots of different varieties, of course, of corn. Um, but they did have a lot of other plants. They also planted watermelon. <laughs> Excuse me, watermelon was also planted during that time. It's my favorite fruit, watermelon. Um, both in, in the summer after the planting and also in the fall during harvest, they would have um, a lot of celebrations and they did a lot of music throughout the year for different things. And Music was a huge part of the culture. It's a huge part of every single culture in the world. Um, it doesn't matter if you're Scottish or you're Irish um, or you're German, music is just uh, really, really important. And it's important to our culture as well. The drum is considered a female instrument. It stands for Mother Earth. Um, it's, it stands for Mother Earth's heartbeat. 
And so if you play the native drum, you always have a, a steady beat. It's always a, a very steady beat, even if it's faster. It doesn't matter. It's very steady, unlike maybe an African beat that da, 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 or another type of, of beat, uh, drum beat. And so because it stands for Mother Earth, if you don't have a steady heartbeat um, as a person, you, you know, we have to call 911 and you have to go into the hospital. And so it actually- hey, Kim, I'm just gonna interrupt one second. I feel like your microphone level changed right when you did the drumming. I don't know if you're, if you're you tapped your microphone just then or what happened? Um, how about, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, now that's good again. Okay. okay. <laughs> Right. Okay. 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 All right. Yeah, I probably did that with the drum. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, it's kind of, it's a bigger drum, so I'll probably tap something. Um, but anyway, um, it stands for the heartbeat of Mother Earth. And so women are allowed to play the drums. Um, they are not allowed to play the big tom drums. And most of the time you will go to a Powell, you will not see a woman playing the gigantic drums um, that they're using for the dancers. Um, and so once, once in a great while, you'll see a woman there, but it's a rarity. Um, it's traditionally a man's, um, a man's uh, instrument, that, that bigger drum. There is um, the story of the jingle dress, which is really, really uh, an important uh, dance and dress um, and regalia for all the native cultures in the US have, and in Canada have actually a jingle dress and every culture has um, a different color, different colors for their dresses, but it's based on an Ojibwa legend about a girl who got very, very sick back in 1918 during the Spanish influenza. And she was dying and her father wanted to figure out a way to help her. And he went to bed praying to get you Manitou to send him something that he could do that he could help his daughter and during a dream that he had when he was asleep um, there was a vision sent to him of a dress that had jingles on it and that he was told his daughter was supposed to wear this dress and dance in it and she would be healed so when he got up from his sleeping he told his wife and they made the first jingle dress it's basically a shifted dress which is a one kind of a one-piece dress almost and it has an apron on the front and kind of a bib on the top. And it has 365 jingles, one for each day of the year. The jingles were called jingles because they, they jingle and they don't actually have a bell tone, they have a jingle tone. And um, they were rolled up snuff can lids that they would roll up on tree branches way back when and then take material and sew them, each of them to the uh, dress, <clears throat> excuse me. And so they put her in the dress when it was finished. She only could move a little bit, she was so weak. But every day they put her, that little girl in that dress and every day she was able to dance a little more. And pretty soon she was dancing all over and she was healed. So that dress is considered very sacred in the native culture. Like I said, every tribe or every tribal nation has a jingle dress. It started with the Ojibwa and it, it moved on from there. When COVID hit, many tribes got together, picked a day and time, and they danced the jingle dress um, dance in their regalia. And they danced for everyone across the world who had been affected by COVID, who had died from COVID, been sick with COVID, struggling to recover from COVID or been touched by COVID. So it was very, very, it was a very special spiritual time for our culture. Um, even though we were one of the last um, groups of people to get vaccinations available, we still felt like it was our, um, it was our duty to do what we could to help the nation in the only way that we could help and um, so that's why that was done. It's definitely a healing dress. 
I have pictures of mine. So I'm going to show you mine. Um, you dance, you dance this dance in the, on the balls of your feet. And it's a quite long song. So you have to have a lot of stamina. Girls start learning how to dance this song to this song um, quite young, two, two and three years old. And so children will have jingle dresses. Um, you'll see them in their jingle dress at that age. So this is mine. Um, like I said, it has 365 jingles on it. It is the Ojibwa colors, red, yellow, blue. Uh, rarely you see orange or purple. Um, they didn't have those colors uh, traditionally. And then I'm in my traditional belt as well. I have one more picture I can show you from that. And this is what it looks like up close. The person that the wonderful woman who made this for me actually took nine months to make that dress because everything is hand sewn on there. So it took quite a long time. When I wear it, you cannot sit down because of the jingles. It's very uncomfortable to sit. And so if you ever go to a powwow, you will notice that they're usually not sitting unless they don't have jingles in the back. Um, and also they um, weigh up, it weighs about 15 to 20 pounds. So when you put it on, it's kind of heavy as well. Okay, um, like um, earlier when uh, I was talking about being an author, I have written several books. I think I'm on, I think there's 15, 13 or 14, 15 books out now. Um, I write Native American fiction and nonfiction and then young adult books on bullying and children's books on bullying because I was bullied as a child. And so I felt it was important to write about that topic because obviously it's still going on and now it's worse because we have cyber bullying going on. Um, and I had hoped that how I handled it and how my parents handled the situation would be helpful to other parents and other uh, children. And so it was important for me to write down my experiences. And so if you're interested in that, um, KimberlySagafis.com is actually my website and that's in the chat. As I close out today, I wanted to, um, before I take questions, I wanted to um, give you a, a few Ojibwe words that you could learn. Um, I, would, I would teach you and then you can amaze all your family and friends that you actually know some native um, if you don't already. And so the first word is Anamush and it's A-N-I-M-O-S-H, Anamush, and it means dog. I actually have two dogs and one of, one of them is Animush. And uh, yes, I know I named her dog, but um, I actually call her Ani. And um, she's a rat terrier and a chow mix. So she's an interesting looking dog, but I, um, both of those dogs are rescues. And so she's the sweetest thing I, I've ever seen. And I love her to death, but her name is Animush and that's dog. My other dog's name is Mika. So M-I-I-K-A, the double eyes. Um, in Ojibwe culture and language is an E sound. So M-I-I-K-A is Mika, and that means beautiful. So her name is, is Mika, beautiful. Um, her middle name is Grace. She got a middle name. She likes to dig in my yard, in my gardens. So when I'm yelling Mika Grace at her sternly, I'm yelling beautiful Grace to remind myself I do love her, even though she's digging up my petunias again. That I just planted. Um, Gawin, it, which is G A W I I N, um, it means no. And believe me, my grandchildren know that, that word by now. Um, my youngest uh, one year old is getting to know that word. We're starting to hear that word from him. Giga Wabaman is goodbye. Giga Waba Men. And it's a long word, but it means goodbye or so long or see you. And so when we're all finished, I will wish you giggle wobble. Are there any questions about anything that I talked about that um, I can answer for you at this time? And thank you. Um, yeah, okay, thank you so much for that. And we just, yeah. there 
so much to cover and we learned about so many different aspects of your life. Um, I was wondering, so do you, and it sounds like you, this is really integral to your life. And so I was wondering, like, do your children and grandchildren, is, is this kind of integral to their lives as well? Do they, how, what, how does that, what is that like? You know, you grow up a certain way, so you don't ever think about it. And so they grew up, they grew up in, um, in, a, in society's culture, but they also grew up with just certain givens. And so they know the Ojibwe words. That's just how they grew up. They mm -hmm. just, you know, it's sort of like if you grew up in a Spanish and English speaking household, you know, you just automatically speak both languages. And so that's kind of how it is. And um, so I think that I don't think they realize that it's anything different. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? For them, mm -hmm. it's a normal way of just this is just how I grew up. Um, they think everybody has wasabi at Thanksgiving. You know, they just expect to have glaze for their their meat because that's how they, you know, the grandkids grew up. Um, my children were my children were uh, my my youngest or my oldest child was two, and I was pregnant with my second child. So they didn't know anything else. I mean, they grew up in that in that uh, mixed culture. Um, because I chose to share that with them. And I wanted to make it uh, um, as normal as possible so that they felt like it was putting on a second skin sort of, you know? Yeah. All right. Okay, we have a couple of questions coming in. Um, someone would like, is asking, when did, Ojibwe, when did Ojibwe begin to resettle in Illinois after being relocated to Oklahoma? Um, people started to come back in, it really, the Ojibwe never really came back. Um, the other, they not. I think Kim is freezing up right now. Um, I know we were having some technical problems before we started and it was working so great. Oh no, I think we just lost her. Um, Maybe she'll come back real quick. Oh my gosh, she lost her internet and her whole community before the program started today. It was completely down and we didn't know if we were going to be able to offer this program and <laughs> we got it working. And now at the last minute, it seems that like she dropped off. Um, and I'm so sorry about this. And we didn't get to answer all the questions. Um, Lisa, I do see your question that you submitted and I will ask Kim, and I will get back to you. I see you have a question in the chat about, um, as a white person, what can I do to be a good ally? And um, yeah, I remember the question. Um, what can I do to be a good ally and help Native Americans with some of the issues that my white ancestors created? And then we have another question from someone, did tribes have animals like cattle, chicken, or goats to provide additional food? Oh, it looks like Kim is joining us again. Okay. Oh my gosh. Okay, Kim. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it kicked time. me off. I am so sorry. No. Apparently, <laughs> apparently there was a big hook and it said, Kim, you have talked way too long. <laughs> no. We're no, kicking no. you off. <laughs> I'm no. so sorry. That was no, no. weird. Okay, no, I'm sorry. What would that's what okay. was the question? Well, the question you were asking before was when the Ojibba returned to Illinois. And you yeah. were it wasn't necessarily the Ojibba, but there were other there were other tribes that came back. Yeah, there okay. really wasn't, Ojibwe really never um, came back into the area, but the other tribes started to come back. Uh, they trickled in, it really didn't start trickling back till the 1900s. There were very, uh, there was a smattering of Native Americans, but again, they were so persecuted against that you, there was no reason to live here because you couldn't find a place to live. You would be run out of town. You couldn't get a job. Um, you would, people would say, are you Native? And you'd go, I uh, know I've been out in the sun too long or, you know, or I know that I'm not native, you know, you to try to even get any sort of life here. It was, it wasn't it really, really wasn't until the fifties, the 1950s that, that people actually started coming back in larger numbers. Wow. So. There's a question here um, that someone asked and the person writes, um, as a white person, what can I do to be a good ally and help native Americans with some of the issues that my white ancestors created? You know, this, 
this question comes up to me a lot. I think, um, first of all, it was horrible. I mean, every, I'm, I think pretty much I'm speaking for everybody. It, it was a horrible thing that they did with the natives back you know, when they removed them from the, you know, when they lost all their rights and they lost all their land and they lied and cheated them and everything. But I think um, as long as you, you live your best life, um, I think you probably, sh I don't think you have to take on the sins of your ancestors, as long as you live a good life now and you treat people with respect. Um, I think there's nothing to make up for. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not sure that you know, I, uh, there's a lot of natives that say, you know, oh, those white people owe us, you know, money and land. And and yes, I can see where that is just because it was taken away from us. But like you didn't take it away from me. You know what I'm saying? So while the government has some explaining to do and has some things that needs to happen probably still. Um, I don't think just personally that any certain, any one person has anything that they can do except for just treating everybody the same with respect, you know, and just acknowledge the differences in people. And I think that if they did that back then, we wouldn't have had this problem at all. We wouldn't have had all this stuff happen. Right. Okay. Well, I know it's a, it's a, there's a lot to think about with regards to that. Um, Someone has a kind of more practical question, and she'd like to know the tribes had animals like cattle, chicken, or goats to provide additional food beyond what they were, you know, hunting. Okay. Okay, ask that question one more time. I'm not sure what the question did is. Did tribes have cattle, chicken? Oh, cattle. Oh, did they have cattle? Mm -hmm. I have not heard of the tribes having cattle. I don't know when cattle came into Illinois. I'm not really sure. I'm sure there's somebody listening right now that knows when cattle came into yeah. Illinois. Um, I know, I don't, originally, I usually talk about the 17, 16, 1700s. I don't think they had cattle here at that time. Mm -hmm. So um, they would have just lived off whatever was here at that time. Are there vegetarians in like the American, like the Indian community? Like it feels like they're really concerned with like the earth and taking good care of the earth. And but other, it seems like, but it also seems like hunting is a big part of the lifestyle. Yeah. Also, like, is vegetarianism um, a thing also in the community? It it is now. Mm -hmm. um, I think back then they probably didn't even think about it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I think they were. It was just what they did was they hunted and. And that's how they lived. Um, but it, yeah, now, of course, you know, there's native people who are vegetarian and they don't eat meat. Um, but yeah, I don't think way back then it was that it was even thought of as, you know, not being the right thing or whatever. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, good. Well, Kim, thank you. I'm sure we got through some, some questions and I just really want to thank you so much for your time today mm -hmm. sharing so much um oh someone wrote many tribes were nomadic and hunters and yeah yes they were yep yeah. they were they, um, they wandered so i just want to say thank you so much for sharing us so many different covering so many different parts of life the music the food the storytelling so many things so i really appreciate it. and i know the technology was an issue this morning so thank you yeah. for being with us that i know that's so stressful and um thank you to everyone who joined us um at home today we hope that you enjoyed hearing from Kim. We hope you fill out your survey. We, you know, I know the Humanities Council would love your feedback and we look forward to seeing you again here um, at the library online soon. So have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>